Hi, everybody. Good morning. Woo! React Rally, day two. It's on. Um, my name is Anjana Vakil. I am so excited to be here at React Rally for the first time. And yesterday was just phenomenal. I don't know about you, but I was blown away by all of the talks. And I've also been blown away by what a, an outstanding job the organizers and staff of this event are doing. Can we quickly give it up for them? They are killing it. Absolutely killing it. Awesome. So I am really excited to be here today to talk to you about the lambda calculus. So take note, not Newton's calculus. We're not going to be doing any differential equations up here. But um, we're going to talk about the lambda calculus, which I think is a really cool uh, abstraction in the history of computer science. Um, what it is not is useful for everyday programming. So. <laughs> Uh, this talk is going to be totally different than the talks you saw yesterday in that you are going to learn nothing here that you can take to work on Monday and tell your boss, well, look at this cool practical thing I learned at React Rally. That's hopefully cool with you. If not, I don't mind if you tune out and just like work on your, you know, work on your super cool like Chithulu's volume slider or whatever it is that you're working on now. So, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> So with, uh, just, just really quickly, a little bit about me. I am a software engineer at Mapbox in San Francisco. Anybody uh, know Mapbox? Use Mapbox? Ooh. Great, nice, quite a few hands, awesome. If you haven't heard of it, we build a location data platform for developers. So we build uh, tools, uh, APIs, SDKs, basically the building blocks you need to put really awesome, totally customized location experiences. So yes, maps, but way beyond that, anything to do with location data into your apps that you're building. I'm not going to talk about that at all, but I would love to talk to you about it in the hallway afterwards, so come find me. I would love to hear what you're building with Mapbox, absolutely. And also I have stickers, so come find me afterwards. Um, I also do a lot of public speaking. I'm a Mozilla tech speaker, and another one of our amazing tech speakers, uh, Princia, is up after the coffee break, so make sure to check out her talk as well. And really quickly, before we dive in, I want to tell you about a couple of organizations, um, communities really, in the tech world that have been just so instrumental to me personally in my doing that career transition, uh, as was mentioned. Um, one is called the Recurse Center. It is a free, unstructured, self-directed programming retreat in New York City. It's just an amazing space and community where you can go and get better at programming, whatever that means to you. Uh, check it out, recurse.com, awesome, awesome place. And another program that I'm super lucky to be an alumna of is called Outreachy, Outreach with a Y. This is an initiative to get more women and underrepresented minorities involved in open source by offering paid remote internships. And applications actually just open for the upcoming round. So if you or somebody you know is looking to get that foot in the door in the open source world, please, please, please send them to outreachy.org. Also, if you or your company maintains an open source project and you might be interested in hosting an intern, also check out outreachy.org. OK, OK, but we're not here to talk about me or the tech communities that I love. Um, we are here to talk about the lambda calculus. The what a calculus? The lambda calculus. So that's like lambda, like the Greek letter, like the like it looks like a little like fancy triangle, like a triangle that went to the salon or something. Um, you might recognize it from the logo of every functional programming language ever, such as Haskell and Clojure, etc. Uh, so the lambda calculus is a mathematical and logical formalism uh, created by this awesome dude, Alonzo Church, starting in the 1930s. He started developing it. Um, and doesn't he just look so fun? Doesn't he just, don't you just want to have a beer with Alonzo? Or a coffee? Yeah, I do. Uh, so yeah, um, Alonzo created this awesome, awesome thing that is, I think, really amazing because it is a very simple construction, very simple abstraction, just one little pure function. And from that, you get a universal, Turing-complete model of computation. You can do all of the things a computer can do with one tiny function. So no big deal, whatever. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, so what is a lambda uh, in, the, in the lambda calculus sense of the word? So I think of this as just a little, um, an anonymous, pure little function. Anonymous, it doesn't have a name. That doesn't really matter. We're going to name some of our functions today just for sanity to make it easier on ourselves. It's a pure function, meaning it has no side effects. All it does is look at its input arguments and return an output value. It doesn't look at anything else in the global state of the world, and it doesn't do anything except return its value. So it doesn't log anything to the console. It doesn't uh, change anything in the global state. So no side effects. 
it's, uh, it's little, what I, one way that it's little is that it only gets one input argument. You get one argument to your function, that's it. Every function, only one. And when I say function, I'm talking about like a little bit more like a mathematical sense. So it uh, takes its inputs and returns an output, and it's always going to return the same output if you give it the same inputs. So OK, what we're going to do today, we're going to play a little game where we are going to pretend that a JavaScript arrow function is a lambda calculus lambda function. OK, so they're not exactly the same. So we're going to have to kind of constrain ourselves to use just sort of a uh, a more uh, tightly, uh, a more constrained version of the arrow function. So when we are doing things in the lambda calculus, we have a slightly different syntax than what we're used to in JavaScript. When we want to make a function, that's called function abstraction. You don't need to know that, but if you want to like, look up terms, you can look that up. Um, we have this lambda symbol, and then the, the symbol for the input argument, which is always something like x or y or something equally unhelpful, all these arbitrary letters, not useful, but uh, that's what we're going to stick with. Then we have a dot, and everything to the right of this dot is the body or like the return value of the function. So here we've just got a really simple little identity function. Um, and in JavaScript, what we're going to do is write that in our, in our handy dandy arrow syntax. Hopefully this looks pretty familiar. We've got the input argument on the left, and then the arrow, and everything to the right is going to be the body or the return value of this function. So here we've got the identity function in arrows. Cool, cool, all on the same page, great, excellent, wonderful. Now, uh, I said that these functions only get one input argument, right? So how do we, what, what happens when we want to do some kind of operation that involves multiple things? Well, we fake it. We fake it till we make it by chaining functions together to kind of pretend that we're taking in multiple arguments. The way that works is we would declare a function or, or create a function that takes in uh, the first thing we need. In this case, let's say we're trying to add two numbers together. So we're going to do a lambda x, and that's going to return another function, which is going to take in a y. And then that function is going to do the operation on both x and y. So in this case, adding them together. Now, in JavaScript, we have the luxury of being able to give it multiple arguments. We could use parentheses and put commas to separate all of our arguments, but we're not going to do that. We're going to play this game where we only get one argument at a time. So what we're going to have to get used to is like looking at these chains of arrows like this, where we're creating a, an arrow function that takes in x, and that returns another arrow function that takes in y and adds them together in, in this case. Cool? Are we on board? We're going to constrain ourselves? Excellent. Wonderful. Wonderful. OK, so now we can't just go around creating functions all day. At some point, we have to also use them uh, or call them, as we say in, in, usually as programmers. But in the Lambda calculus, that's called function application. Again, don't need to remember that. In case you want to look it up later, that's a term. And so when, in the Lambda calculus, when we want to call or apply a function that we have, we're going to use spaces before the input values that we want to pass in. Um, and so this is, what this is going to say here is like, OK, uh, call this function or apply this function to 5. That's going to give us this new function which takes in y and adds 5 to it. And then we're going to apply that to 1, and that's going to give us 5 plus 1, which gives us 6. Yeah? So in JavaScript, we're going to have almost identical syntax. The only difference is that we have to wrap our um, input values in parentheses, as we always do in JavaScript. And again, because we only get one at a time, we're going to have to get used to seeing these like rows of, of multiple uh, parentheses, one after the other. So this is, again, we're going to call it the first one with 5. That's going to give us this function. We call it with 1. We get 5 plus 1. We get 6. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. Awesome. OK. So these are just the ground rules. These are the ground rules. And we're going to now see, if we play this game, if we pretend that the JavaScript arrow function is a lambda, what can we do with it? Well, I've already spoiled that answer for you. We can do everything. Literally everything that a computer can do, we can do it. Um, not in 30 minutes, but uh, we'll get as far as we can. Uh, so let's start with something that we all hopefully know and love, and that's very useful when programming. You know what's really useful in doing programming is numbers, right? Don't we all just love numbers? Programmers love numbers. You love numbers? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, not everybody loves numbers in here. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Hopefully, we'll, we'll turn you around on that. Um, and you know what else is fun is counting stuff. So whole numbers are like extra fun because then you can count things. But we're in a world where all we have are tiny little arrow functions. So what can we count? We don't have any numbers we don't have. What can we count in a world where all we have are functions? I'm going to let you ponder that while I take a sip of water. 
I see the gears turning. Okay, so what we know how to do is create functions and call functions, right? Uh, abstraction and application. So if I have a function that I've created, what if I consider that if I call it once, that's like counting one. And if I call it again, that's like counting two. And so on and so forth. What if I count the function applications? What if I count calls to a function and take that as my kind of numbery thing? Okay, this is what we're gonna do. It's gonna feel a little weird at first, but hopefully we'll get used to it in the next few minutes. All right, so in the lambda calculus, everything is gonna be a function. And um, number, numbery functions are gonna be something that take some other function and apply it a certain number of times to an arbitrary input. So that means they're gonna need to operate on both a function, let's call it f. So we're gonna have a function that takes in some other function f. That's gonna return a function, because everything is functions, um, which takes in some arbitrary input x and does something, I don't know. And so all of our numbers are gonna have this kind of shape where uh, we take in some function f and apply it a certain number of times to x. So for one, for example, we're gonna take that function f and call it one time on x. Cool? And two, we're going to call the function twice, so f of f of x, okay? Any guesses what three is gonna be? Help me out, help me out, y'all. Brilliant, you are all on it, and it's like you've barely even had coffee, you're doing so great. Okay, and then for zero, we're probably gonna not wanna apply f at all and just return x. x. Oh my gosh, what a great crowd. Okay, now, so these things, I don't know about you, but these don't immediately strike me as integers. <laughs> they look like weird functions that do stuff with an F, I don't know. So let's convince ourselves that this is, these are actually numbers. We're, we're gonna cheat a little bit. We're gonna make a, like a sanity check function um, that's gonna convert these lambda-e numbers to like actual JavaScript numbers, okay? So what we're doing here, we've got a two number function. It's gonna take in some lambda number n and it's gonna call that n on an f, where our f here is just a little function that is like an increment, it adds one to whatever input we give it. Okay, and then we're gonna kick off that like call f multiple times, we're gonna kick that off with our x being zero. So if I call this function zero times, I should get zero, and if I call it once, I should get one, and if I call it twice, and so on and so forth. Yeah, are we on board? Seem reasonable? Great, okay, wonderful. So if I've done everything right, which live coding, who knows, um, I should be able to pass in my number three and get JavaScript three. Okay, cool. And, but just so that you know that I'm not like lying to you and this is actually real, uh, we can try it with the others. Sweet, okay. Are we relatively convinced that we've got something number-ish? Great, wonderful. Now, now that we've got number-ish things, what we can do is start operating on them. Oh, and so, uh, Again, speaking of terms to, to look up if you want to Google, th or should I say DuckDuckGo things later, uh, these are called church numerals. Um, this is just the, the way of representing numbers as these type of functions. It, they're called church numerals. So if you want to DuckDuckGo something, you can DuckDuckGo that. Okay, great. Now that we've got some numbers, let's do some math. Yeah, let's go back to kindergarten and like add some numbers together. Okay, let's say we have two numbers, N and M. How do we add them together if what those numbers do is count calls to a function? F. I'm gonna let you ponder while I drink water. Ponder away. Okay, so let's imagine that n is two and m is three. If I wanna get five, what I'm gonna wanna do is call the function n times, so two, so I get one, two, and then continue to call the function m more times. So uh, three, four, or five. That's how counting works, right? Okay. Uh, so what we're gonna do is call the function n times and then call it m more times. Let's make an add function. Um, this is gonna operate on two numbers, right? So again, we're getting used to like this chaining arrows together. So we're gonna have a function that takes an m, an n return a function that takes an m. And what kind of thing are we gonna need this to return? Well, it's a function, yeah, but what, what kind of function? A number, yeah, when we add two numbers together, we probably expect to get another number, right? Yeah, so uh, we know what the, what the church numeral kind of shape is now, so we're gonna return another number, which is a thing that takes an F, 
which returns a thing that takes an X and does some stuff to it. Okay, so this looks weird, but we're gonna do math here. All right, so we said first we need to call the function n times. So that looks like applying n to f and then applying that to x, right? That's how, like what we did in the two number function. But then we also wanna continue to call f m more times. So what if we take the output of whatever this whole thing is, like the result once we've called it n times, once we called f n times, and we call f m more times on the result of that? Huh? Huh? Look at all those parentheses. That's how you know you're doing functional programming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. So if this worked, and it might not, because it's early in the morning and this is live, um, then I should be able to add one to three and get something, a numeral for four. Yeah? Let's see. Drum roll, please. Uh, add. Yay. Addition. <laughs> Woo! We did it. Okay, but maybe I'm lying to you. Maybe I, like, rigged this. I don't know. So let's, uh, let's try it out. Like, what happens if we try to add two and three? Uh, five. Oh, oh. Oh, should we try some edge cases? Oh, it even works with zero. Look at that. Cool. Okay, so we added. We added. Adding is cool. How about multiplication? Hmm. Think on it. Think on it. Okay, so again, if n is 2 and m is 3, uh, and I want to multiply them to get 6, what I'm going to want to do is call f n times, right, like 1, 2, but I'm going to want to do that whole thing three times, right? So that would be like one time I get 2, and then a second time I get 3, 4, and then a third time and I get 5, 6. Yeah? Yeah? Multiplication? We're all like back, we're like, wait, is that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So what we're going to want to do is call the function f n times and do that whole thing m times over. Okay, so let's make our multiply function. Um, help me out here. So now it's going to need to take in an n, right? And then an m. And it's going to return a, a number, so another thing that takes f, exactly, and x. And oh my gosh, it's so laborious, but it's amazing because it's all of computation. Okay. And so, okay, first we said we need to call f n times, as we always do. But then we need to do this thing, this like act of calling n f times. We need to do that m times. Now, remember, everything is functions here, right? So the result of applying n to f or calling n on f, that's some function that I'm then going to apply to x. But this is just a function like any other. So what I want to do is do that m times. Now, if only I had a way to tell the computer to take a function and call it a certain number of times. Oh, wait, that's what numbers do. That's what they're for. So what if I treat this n of f as like another f and call that m times? Huh? And then apply that whole thing to x. OK. What do you think? Is this going to work? What? Yes? OK. Excellent. You have so much faith in me. That might be misplaced. Um, <laughs> let's try it out. Let's try to multiply 2 and 3. Drum roll, please. Uh, it worked. Huzzah. OK, but let's see if it works with other things. OK. All right. Awesome. Should we? Uh, oh, what about this? Oh, it even works with 1. Oh, god. What happens if I do? Oh, my god. Edge case. Yes. Yes, test pass. OK, great. So now, y'all, we just did so much of computation. We just created like a really powerful system that can talk about numbers and add and multiply them together. You know what that allows us to do is like really, really sophisticated computation to think deep thoughts like, what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? Well, if you add 2 to the result of multiplying 4 times the result of multiplying 2 to the result of adding 4 plus 1, you should get the answer is 42! <laughs> Y'all, we did it! Yes! Give yourselves a hand. Absolutely amazing work. Um, you know, we just did as much computational work as the entire planet of Earth. Like, these are Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy jokes, by the way. Anyway. Um, so this, is, this might not seem like we've done a lot. Like, we're back in kindergarten. All we can do is add and multiply. But it's still pretty cool. But uh, in order to do uh, programming, we're going to need to do a little bit more than simple math. So what else do we need to write programs? Like, help me out. What else are we going to need? Shout out some things. Functions. Check. We have those. 
Okay, loops, yes, we could get there eventually, but we're not gonna have time today. Conditions. Conditions, oh my gosh, it's almost like I just planted a person in the first row of the audience. <laughs> yes, we are gonna need conditional, we're gonna need branching logic, right? Conditionals and Booleans, if we're gonna need conditionals, then we're also gonna need some Boolean values to tell us which path in the condition to take, right? These kind of go hand in hand. So we're gonna think about this like the same way that we do in, in these ternary uh, sort of ifs here. We're gonna have some Boolean, and if that Boolean is true, we're gonna have like a, a then thing that we're gonna wanna do. And if the Boolean is false, we're gonna have a, an else thing that we're gonna wanna do, yeah? Conditionals, branching logic, very, very exciting. Okay, now, what we're gonna need to do is define all of these like at the same time because they go hand in hand. So okay, buckle up, let's see if we can do this. All right, so an if then else thing here is gonna need all three of those parts. It's gonna need a Boolean, and then something in the then case, and something in the else case. I'm gonna call it else do instead of else because JavaScript is reserved, yeah, you know. Anyway, and then it's gonna do, I don't know what. We'll figure it out later if I can even type the word to do, okay. So now, um, the Booleans themselves, they're gonna be the thing that like chooses which one of these to do. So what they're gonna, they're gonna look like is they're gonna take in the then and the else do, and they're gonna choose one of them. Like that's what they are as Booleans, that's who they are. They choose between right and wrong, left and right. So the true one is gonna be by definition the thing that when it is here, we do the then. So it's gonna pick the then. And by the same account, or conversely, the uh, false, and I'm just using true and false because so we don't collide with JavaScript true and false. Um, the false one is just gonna be the thing that picks the else, yeah? Like by definition, that's how these are gonna work. So the if statement then is gonna just be the result of applying the Boolean that we have to the two, to the else, the if and the else that we have and seeing which one it picks. Cool? Cool. cool. All right, great. Uh, let's see if we can use this to write a really, really useful program. This program is gonna tell me how many coffees I need to drink today. Now, the number of coffees that I'm gonna drink today depends on whether or not I'm tired. If I'm tired, I'm gonna need a lot of caffeine, like probably like three cups. And if I'm not tired, I'm gonna need just like one cup, because I can't have no coffee, that would be ridiculous. Um, so, now today I am definitely tired, because I don't know if you noticed, but there was a karaoke party last night. And so I am tired is definitely true. And I'm gonna ask this program to tell me the number of coffees that I need to drink today. Ready? Let's see what happens. I might have messed it up. I don't know, it's live. Uh, oh, okay, it told me I need three coffees today, cool. But maybe, maybe, um, just talk, being here with all of you, talking to you all about the Lambda Calculus has just breathed new life into me. And I am no longer feeling tired. So uh, tired is now false. And it should tell me that I only need one coffee today. You all, do you know what we just did? We just wrote branching logic using nothing but arrow functions? Hello, is that not amazing? You're like, eh. I'm like, what? Yeah. Great work, great work, okay. So now I'm running out of time, but let's see if we can do a little more logic in the time we have left. So uh, now that we've got Booleans, we can make some logical operators, right? Everybody loves logical operators. Huh? Crickets, okay. So before we go any further, I'm just gonna make another little sanity check function, which is going to take a Boolean and apply it to JavaScript true and false so that we can just like read the value of the Boolean, okay? So it's just gonna convert it to a JavaScript Boolean, just like we did with the numbers earlier. So two Boolean on false should give me false, and so on with true, yeah, cool? Sanity check. All right, now, let's write the not operator, okay. Let's think through this one together. So not is gonna operate on just one Boolean value, right? And it's gonna return what kind of thing? I mean, it's a function, but what kind of function? A another Boolean, yeah. So that's something that takes in a then and takes in an else and picks one of them, right? Now usually we, we are used to seeing it like this, but this would give me the same value as the Boolean I passed in. So how do I get it to give me the opposite value? Hmm. What if we get real tricksy 
and just doop -a doop -a doop -a doop switch him around and trick the thing into giving me the wrong one. <laughs> so now if this worked, I should be able to do not true and get false. And I should be able to do not false and get true. Yeah. All right. We've got opposites. <laughs> Now we can do opposite day, it's exciting. But we're gonna need more than that, right? How about an or operator? Hmm, hmm. Okay, since I'm running out of time, we're gonna power through this. So or is gonna operate on two Booleans. I'm gonna name them A and B. And uh, let's, let's, let's walk through this. So a Boolean, we said each of these is a, is a Boolean, so it's gonna be a thing that is applied to two values and then we, it chooses one of them, right? Okay, let's hypothesize for a moment, shall we? that the Boolean A is, um, is true. If it's true, do I need to even care about B? No, right, not for or. So if it's true, I immediately wanna already return true. Now if it's true, it's gonna choose whatever this first thing is, right? And we want it to return a true value. So how about we tell it to return something that we know is true, like A, because we've hypothesized that A is true, yeah? Okay, but now let's, let's hypothesize that A is false. If A is false, it's going to choose whatever's here. And if A is false, then in order to evaluate the OR, we need to also look at B, right? And then the whole truth value of the entire OR is going to be whatever the value of B is. If B is true, it's going to be the whole thing is true and false and so on. So why don't we just have it return B? Yeah? Okay. Looks weird, but maybe it'll work. So if this worked, then I should be able to do OR on true and true and get... True, okay, cool, but I don't necessarily believe that this works entirely. Let's try true and false. Also true. Okay, what about, oh, that one's false, and let's just complete the truth table. Yes, y'all, we did a truth table. Yeah. The philosophy student in me is like super excited right now. Okay, um, and really quick, let's power through the and. So now that we know how or works, hopefully we can figure out how and works. So again, we're gonna, these things are gonna apply to two things, and all right, if A is true, we do need to look at B, right, for and. And the whole, value, whole, the whole thing is gonna evaluate to whatever the value of B is. So let's just have it pick B. If A is true, it'll pick B, and then if B is true, it'll be true, and if B is false, it'll be false. And if A is false, we can just have it immediately return false, which is A, yeah? Makes total sense, right? Exactly, now let's prove it. All right, let's try and true and true. We get true and true and false, false. And all of the rest of these should hopefully also be false. Two tooth tables. Yay. Okay. Excellent work, y'all. Excellent work. You're just powering through these. Okay. Look at all of this stuff that we have just done with little tiny arrow functions that we were pretending were lambdas. We got some data. We've got numbers, super useful for counting. We've got Boolean, super useful for opposite day and determining coffee counts. Um, we've got arithmetic, we've got logic, control flow, branching ifs, like kapoof, right? We've already got so much, we were already able to compute the answer to life, the universe, and everything. So all of this, this way of representing data and logic, this is called church encoding, encoding these values in these functions this way. That's the term you can go DuckDuckGo or Wikipedia to, to read more about this. And uh, church numerals are just kind of a special case of church encoding. So these are just the things, if you want to follow up on this, you don't need to remember those words, but if you want to, they're useful terms. So we could do so much more than this. This has really just scratched the surface. We could do more arithmetic. We could subtract and divide. They're way harder, but also possible. Um, we could have predicate functions. We could have inequalities. Um, we could even talk about strings once we wrap our heads around the idea of representing characters as like their character codes, right? Uh, the numbers that we already have. We can even do data structures, lists. We can, we can do operations on lists, like mapping and reducing and filter, and then we are full-on functional programming, and we can do whatever we want. You know, all of computation. So yeah, this has just been a really, really brief taster. I hope it's been fun. I've had a great time with you all. Thank you so much. If you want to check out the, uh, this notebook that we've been going through together, you can play with it on your own. I think that's really the best way to learn this stuff, is to really dig in and like grapple with it. Um, so that's up on my GitHub gist, uh, Vakil A. And um, there's also a great talk by Corey Haynes. He goes into this in a little bit more detail and in a different uh, light. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, React Rally, for having me. And yeah, go forth and Lambda. Thank you. Woo!